Well, here I am back on part two of OSTF questions. Didn't mean to make it two parts, but for some reason the last video just stopped. <laughs> so, straight back into it, shall we? We know from Adrian Brenox Fox that Mark McMurtry was used to go and obtain signatures from elder elders to somehow tie up his house and protect it through endless litigation in the courts. So we know that the uh, tool they use to achieve an outcome is to use the validity of elders to get them to sign something so that it can then be used for the benefit of someone like Adrian Brennock to then make some kind of claim which would then tie it up in endless litigation and protect his house that is crucial to the development. So we know that elders have signed things and so let's look a bit deeper and ask some questions about what elders have signed that OSTF members present to them. For every action you see one of them serving a legal document an elder has signed a form to go with it. Let's ask some questions. But before I do ask those questions, what I'm referring to is things further down in this post where they are serving uh, trespass notices on people. And those trespass notices come with the validity of the elders, the traditional owners. So they are using the authority of the elders to act on where they are blurring the lines between between trying to trying to marry tribal law and Australian law so any of the tribal communities out there if you know one of your elders has signed anything with the OSTF Maybe these are questions that you could be asking yourself of what did the elder sign and what does it mean in the perspective of the tribe? How could that impact on the tribe? But let's just ask some questions. What did you sign? Did you get a copy of what you signed? What did OSTF state was in the document? What was the purpose of the document? What is your belief is in the document? This is what you signed. It is a document. That's what it's going to be called anyway. <laughs> so when I say document, it's what you signed. What did you sign? You know, these are questions. What is your belief was in the document? What were you told was the reason you needed to sign this form? Or well, form, document, it's a piece of paper. <laughs> Even if you just gave it a thumbprint, you know, that's a, a signature, that's you giving your authority, that's signing. Was the document you signed used as intended? Was that action successful? Are there any unforeseen circumstances as a result of signing this document? Did signing the document bring benefit to the tribe or harm or nothing? Will signing the document bring about OSTF's mission promise? Was the document fully explained to you in your language? I'm going to stop there and ask again. 
when they came on to your country and they showed respect to you, did they fully explain to you in your own language, in a language you understand and a way you understand it? Did they explain it in your language? Phys physically in your tongue and also in the terms of your understanding. Did they fully explain this to you? Because if you are not f made fully aware and English is not your first language, well then you are at a disadvantage. And one question I might ask too in association with that that what opportunity were you given to sit down and discuss this in your own language with everyone within your tribe before making a decision that was given to someone where your language is not their language. And it isn't Mark McMurtry's, it isn't David Cole's, it isn't Robbie Mills. These people have got um, a different language. It's got to do with legalese and redefining the meaning of words to suit themselves. So were you told of any possible risks before signing the document? Full disclosure of any risks. Now also too, when you were presented with this document to sign, not only was it, were you explained it in your own language, but was it written in your own language? Were you provided with a copy in your own language so that you could easily verify within your own terms of, and framework of thinking? Because everybody thinks differently according to uh, where you live and, and how you do things. Everyone's different. And you know, this is what we actually love. We say, why can't people be on the same page and all think the same? And that if they do all think the same, they get blamed and called sheep. Nobody likes a carbon copy of the next person. We like similarities in base understanding, but when it comes to the creative parts of human beings, we love to see that expressed in many different ways. Well, I do anyway. <laughs> so further to any documents that elders have signed, can the OSTF provide a copy of that signed document? Can the OSTF prove that any such signed document exists. Because there are claims and none of those claims are ever backed up publicly by anything in the way of proof. Uh, very rare occasions will you get something that is actually usable like when Mark McMurtry posted a copy of the liquidator's letter. And it's interesting to note too that the post that that letter went with was also an exact copy and paste on Dean Rodimer's <laughs> Facebook. It's like what were they all given the same instructions to go out and copy and paste and spread the word. You know we're innocent now because here's the liquidator's letter to say we're innocent. <laughs> Actually, here's a liquidator's letter to show that we just phoenixed it back and we're up Poops Creek. But, you know, getting government departments and all these ones to, to act is never a, a quick process. Uh, I think Mark McMurtry should understand that, but he expects that, oh, look, I'm going to make a complaint and they're going to go out there tomorrow and they're going to come knocking on his door. No, he gets to sit back and wait for that. <laughs> anyway, off subject. So, back to the documents that elders have signed. What does the document say? 
And what is the purpose in signing it? I know I've already asked these questions, but I'm asking it again in other ways because it is important to know what you could be legally held accountable for because it might not mean anything to you that you signed that paper, but it means everything that if that piece of paper is taken into an Australian court and used where Mark McMurtry tries to use all those pieces of paper in the court system, in the system of the Crown he so despises, he goes in trying to beat them at their own game. And he hasn't figured out it's a rigged system. He's saying it's a rigged system. He's flogging a dead horse. I did say that further on in this post. <laughs> So yes, what have you signed to be held legally accountable for? Because if Mark McMurtry takes a piece of paper that one of your elders has signed into an Australian court and presents it there, that then puts that elder in the legal implication of having to answer to the courts of Australia because of the signature that has been presented by Mark Murtry, Mark McMurtry into the courts. He is doing this, putting the elders' signatures into the court system to use. Well, we know one of those was obtained to protect AB's house. Adrian Brannock, the bankrupt, that is. Before going further into specific questions relating to specific activities associated with Mark McMurtry, let's explore the philosophy of Mark McMurtry. What is Mark McMurtry's philosophy? What is his intent with the long-term goals? Does he also manipulate words and change their meanings. In his interpret is his interpretation of the law correct? Is his philosoph philosophy realistically achievable? Did you know that the root of cultural is cult? Did you know that cult means that which is seen? Did you know that occult means that which is unseen. Is the cult philosophy of Mark McMurtry destroying the tribes from within? How do you know that Mark McMurtry is right? Did you know that any wordsmith can redefine words and manipulate your thoughts? Did you know spelling, spells, words are manipulated by deceivers? Has Mark McMurtry given you more freedom through joining the OSTF? Has his philosophy changed your life in beneficial ways? Has it aided your whole community? And I'm emphasizing, well not emphasizing, I'm actually allowing um, time in between everything because you know what, this is like a kid coming to you with why, 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 you know, you get a hundred questions all in a row, you know, your head starts to spin. So I'm just slowing it down to actually give you a chance to actually have the thoughts have a little bit of a response to them before I move on to the next one. Because if you've noticed that people that want to control the situation will always talk fast. And there's even criticism of people who, who speak slowly because, well, can't you think and speak faster? Oh yeah, I can. But the whole purpose of communication and speaking is communication, is to be understood. So why speed up everything in the frame of 
letting people take in thoughts to let them have their own thoughts in relation to that. Because if you just shoot all these words at someone and they don't have any time to stop and think about it and have their own thoughts, uh, you zone out. You lose the point of what were you talking about. Because you're not allowing the, your own thoughts to come in. Like any time someone says something or you're looking, even though you think that you're not even thinking about anything, but your mind is responding and it's a soaking in what people are saying or it's processing it and either rejecting it or taking it on board. And it may miss things because people speak fast. They don't let people that are just learning these concepts the time to actually get their head around the thoughts that have been coming up in your head. And questions are designed to create thoughts. So, yes. And why I've actually done the blog of all the questions, and I will leave a link for it underneath the video, is so that rather than have to listen to me ask these questions, you can go straight to the blog and say, well, hang on, this question was asked and I did have a bit of a, what, what was that question and what were the other questions that I wouldn't mind knowing myself? So, and I mean, and you may even remember too that there were questions I didn't bring up that you've got yourself and you would like to find out that truth and follow it up for yourself. Because this is how you obtain the truth and proof. Not through other people, but through yourself. Now, I'm going to bring up just briefly the matter of the donations. Back in 2013, Mark Darwin was promoting truthology, uh, through truthology, uh, the OSTF. When it first started and brought everything onto the scene, truthology was promoting it because he was, well, the two Marks, Mark McMurtry and Mark Darwin, were already friends. And in fact, the um, Destiny's Rescue, Destiny Rescue, their main charity, then got bumped down to the bottom of the list while the OSTF got put up the top for uh, donate to these people. So from the minimum of 2017, uh, 2013, sorry, there has been the ability to receive donations and give donations. And I can't find the part where it says, it's actually got uh, Samuel McMurtry, Rose Marie M McMurtry, and also bank account details and PayPal details to use to pay or donate. So the fact that OSTF actually receives donations. Now, being a friend of Mark Darwin's, it may be... Mm, a stretch of the imagination but it might be a little bit more accurate to say that the OSTF has actually been set up as a non-profit non-profit um, not non-government organization to receive those donations exactly how um, Mark Darwin was setting up all the foundations for all these hundreds of others, there's a good chance that one of those foundations is the OSTF. And it seems to be that the Westpac Bank was the ones that would allow that, um, the articles of the foundation to actually be registered. Because I was giving some thought to this and other circumstances, you know, from way back and it is possible that the articles of the foundation or the establishment 
of this association are held at the bank in association with the ability to manage the funds in and out. So it's highly likely that Westpac Bank, not only with the account details that are given out for people like Max Egan as well, they use Westpac, um, they would hold the Articles of Association. And uh, so that's where you'd start looking, I dare say, to find out what donations have been going through an account. And, uh, well, I don't know how you'd go about PayPal. So let's get into some more questions. Who has benefited from all the donations? And where did all the money go? All that money I've just talked about that's been going into bank accounts for the OSTF, what accountability is there for it? Who makes the decisions with OSTF? Are decisions made with consultation and agreements of all member tribes? Can all the tribes work together to achieve Mark McMurtry's goals? Will you give up your tribe's culture to follow what Mark McMurtry applies to all the tribes? Remember, if he's said that over 200 have joined, and if you have signed anything, if you have agreed to anything, what are the conditions that he can lay down that you should have to abide by? Is he any less a master than... Mm, well, I prefer to be master of myself. Because what happens if you disagree with Mark McBurtry? What happens if you ask questions of him? Have you seen his consistent abuse in comments over the years? Has he lived the philosophy of do no harm? Why, as a New South Wales tribal man, as claimed, did he go to the Walpuri for a skin name? Why didn't Mark McMurtry spend time on country and in the ways, learning, learning all about the culture, the song lines, stories, um, everything, law, going through law. It, it's something that, sorry, I wanted to ask more in that question, but I'm trying to keep them simple. You know what I'm talking about. Mark McMurtry flew in and he asked to be adopted into the tribe that wasn't his own tribe. He's got no blood connection to the tribe and yet he wants to be adopted into it. And he hasn't spent time on country, he hasn't learned any of the ways. He hasn't shown the due respect just because he can come on and spin a salesman's yarn. That's not respect. As far as I'm concerned, a salesman is less than honest. He's out to achieve something. And that is always showing, oh, we can succeed if, but never, you know what, we've failed and we've failed so many times because. To not be respectful and be honest about the pros and the cons and to say and to intimate too that there are successes when there are none so he's gone there fly in fly out to get his skin name from the Walpri he has not spent time on country why not why hasn't he spent time on country does Mark McMurtry know the language of the Walpri can he speak it? Did he learn it? Well, of course not. Unless he's some bloody savant. <laughs> yeah, well, I w would say no. Why did Mark McMurtry need to be in adopted into the Walpri? 
to gain a skin name that came from no bloodline connection, no connection to country, the song lines, nothing in the area. He was a fly in, fly out. What was wrong with his own skin name, the one he was born with, with the bloodline of his tribe? Why does Mark McMurtry constantly defame and abuse women? Why does Mark McMurtry only answer questions with narcissistic abuse? Does Mark McMurtry have anger management issues? Does Mark McMurtry have mental health issues? Does Mark McMurtry have moral compass issues? Is his behaviour doing no harm to the land, the people or the wildlife? Is his volition true? Let's take a little closer look at a couple of the specific areas. The first being what Mark McMurtry intends to develop on the sacred land at Wollumbin. Take a closer look at those black dots. Let me just highlight here. Looks like the veins on a leaf. And see all those dots going along there and there? And look at all these dots, they come up around here, they go up around here, they go all along there. There's over three and a half thousand acres of sacred land and they intend to turn it into suburbia. Yes, those little black dots, they are houses, suburbia, over 440 lots on average, another thousand people on the land, plus how many cars per household. So that's quite a burden. And to be sticking them all next to each other, this uh, whole bunch of lots down here, uh, there's no trees, there's no privacy. If you're buying lots there, you may as well be in suburbia because to get any privacy, you're actually going to have to stick up a fence and that's going to be more hassles so I don't know but then again the, these are only just pretty pictures because let's the DA is not going to get approved this what you're looking at here in this map is a pipe dream that can never be fulfilled even with the um, concept of six places like a one place per hundred hectares or something like that there's still only or yeah something that was discussed in the um, court transcript about the but it was never looked at even the judge took because he didn't know anything about it he said well I don't really need to know because you know that doesn't need to be taken into consideration but then you see, if you don't know what something is, how do you know that it shouldn't be taken into consideration? It could affect it. So on this sacred land, instead of doing no harm, they intend to overburden the land with at least a thousand more people. And I think the uh, figures showed too that the average person household of those 440 lots will have um, two maybe three cars so let's just say as many cars as there are people perhaps more in this one address this one little allocated area another reason why it will not be approved by council it has been told to the developers the developers are not being up are not being up front about what they can do with the property so the nightcap on Minjimbul development offering DA pre-approved lots at 285,000 
There is no DA approval and it is the consistent advice of Council that none will be given for the concept proposed. No multiple occupancy dwellings approval will be given for this water catchment area. Restricted by the SEPP, the developers seek to overturn. See, they are planning to go to the state and use that particular state law or um, section to get the development approved. They've already tried to do that and they said, no, it's a water catchment area, not on. You'll have to go back to council, only what they will allow and approve there through all of their regulations. So that's why state approval is denied due to water catchment restrictions. So Mark McMurtry is not even representing the information about NICAP on Minjimbal properly. But he will, if you ask him any questions or bring out any of this information, he'll say, you don't know it, but he does. But then I guarantee you, if he was taken into court and asked to answer these questions, he'd have the exact opposite. Oh, I don't remember. I wasn't really told that. I was only led to believe, oh, um, I think it might be. Yeah. So all this, I'm king of the castle and know-it-all, will suddenly turn into, oh, I can't say that, I might be held responsible. And so you should be held responsible. You know, he's got bipolar disorder, I'm sure, because he swings from, <laughs> yeah, different sides of hypocrisy. So given what I've just said about this planning development, is this plan development doing no harm? Is it respectful to the sacred land? Is it bringing no harm to the wildlife? Is it only bringing suburbia to the country? Yeah, because that's what it looks like to me. I'm sorry, but that's what suburbia looks like. Houses all lined up next to each other. You don't move to the country to live in suburbia. And even the locals and other people that have tried explaining this to the people at OSTF and the nightcap on Minjimbal people, they just go, oh, you're just racist. It's like, yeah, okay, that wasn't even... And this is how they come in. They do the politician talk and they never, ever answer any of the questions. And the questions you do ask, if you keep insisting, some smart ass will come in and say, well, who are you, you to ask? You don't need to know. It's like this is a, a publicly advertised development for sale and you can't even get questions answered by the developer or one of them without being called all these names because you asked the question. It's like, don't ask the questions. We know it all. Yeah, well, what is it that you do know? Well, I'm not telling you. <laughs> you know, you go and research it. Well, I have researched it. That's why I'm asking you questions. It's contradicting the sales pitch. So I'm asking you in person, what is it? Oh, you're not asking me in person. You're asking me over Facebook or somewhere. No, you come up to country. You come and sit in circle. And yeah, if you want to take me on, I'll tell you the truth. Oh, he's just such a little boy. And so many of them are such little boys. They're getting so nauseating to so many people because they are doing harm. But then again, that's not a question, is it? That's an opinion and mine. <laughs> Don't have to share it. Well, another little thing too that I haven't put on here. Is the development advising that one of its developers is an undischarged bankrupt? Because by law, any business dealings that Adrian Brennock has, 
especially on something that would be so large scale as a $36 million development. Any potential investors, has he inv advised, I am a undischarged bankrupt and do you still want to invest in this development? <laughs> yeah. And that's why it's not part of the sales spiel because, you know, if that by law, as Adrian Brannock is required to do. Rod Rodney Cullerton is also advised is under the same laws where he has to advise when he's dealing with business associations and tell people up front that he is an undischarged bankrupt. You need people to be aware of this so they are aware of the full facts informing any opinions or contracts or agreements in any way, shape or form, in any capacity. Is advising people that there is pre-approval when there isn't in accordance with do no harm and true volition? Is this development about what is claimed or is it about money? If it wasn't about money, why overburden the land with so many lots to sell? At $285,000 a lot, 440 lots, yeah, add it up. And I guarantee you that um, 285000 is only going to be, you know, so many. Then it's going to go up again for the next release. And then up again and up again and up again. So if you think you came to a final figure by multiplying, yeah, you haven't allowed for an inflation uh, of ego. <laughs> anyway, so... If it wasn't about money, why overburden the land with so many lots to sell? I repeat myself. Is it a comforting thought that Mark McMurtry's co-developer, Adrian Brennock, is an undischarged bankrupt and knows exactly how to deal with a $36 million development? Because he knows how to deal with his own affairs so well. He can deal with these large-scale ones even better. Is that comforting to know that one of Mark McMurtry's uh, partners, co-developers, is a bankrupt and on the political side he's got a bankrupt on the other side? <laughs> yeah. Are past lost investors suddenly going to disappear and get their money back? Because no matter how much people can, you know, say it's all bullshit there is proof out there that people have lost money and they haven't got it back and it's as simple as that the reasons haven't been uh, fully explored yet and the evidence has not been fully explored it will be though trust me it'll get there is this just another example of a pyramid scheme. Well, it works exactly like a pyramid scheme does because there is so much of this getting already previous members to put money in and then when they've put money in to get reimbursed for everybody that they bring in. And I was looking at a statement of money that was spent between 2016 and 2018. Tyler Tolman was paid over 138000 in sales commissions. And he also has a share in the business. Now, if this isn't a way of reaping back into the pyramid scheme, there are other ways of setting up companies that actually have no business activity 
and then paying them consultation fees for no existing consultation. Very interesting transactions. But I'm getting a bit off subject here, but this is Mark McMurtry's business partner. This is all the kind of characters that he's involved with. And he has set up the a guarantee of the OSTF Foundation exactly in the same way that Mark Darwin has set up foundations. He will have companies to also hide um, things behind as well as an association in the form of the foundation that the members will be anonymous behind. It's all been planned for a long time, at least seven years old, this setup. You can see when you start to really look at the information, you can ask a lot of questions. And there are a lot of questions because nobody likes to answer them. The people associated with Mark McMurtry all avoid answering questions. If they are asked questions directly, they do not like to answer them. They put out their sales pitch in their videos. You know, they'll do a lecture and you get to listen to them have their sermon on the mount. But don't ask them any questions because, you know, that's not going to fare well. Whilst Mark McMurtry makes out they have had success with OSTF in the courts, if the court allows the case to be submitted, all attempts fail. Whether the system is, as McMurtry claims, corrupt and unbeatable, the question is, is he flogging a dead horse? If the system is as corrupt and as invalid as McMurtry claims, then can there ever be any realistic expectation McMurtry and OSTF can achieve anything? Is Mark McMurtry full of hot, hot air or can anything he say achieve a win? What would you win? What can he win for you that you can't achieve for yourself? If all he does is fail, then how is anything achieved? What progress has been made in 10 years? Will progress ever be made beyond this point? Can progress ever be made swimming against the rip? Because, you know, every time I ask this question in my head, what progress have they made? I see a car bogged and its tyres are just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning, doing the same thing over and over and over. That's what I see the OSTF have done for the last 10 years. And they would say that a lot of the money that has been donated to them has gone to pay for all those failed legal attempts. But there really are no current ones. And the attempts that they're making are still only based on the same information. They can't gather any more from the solicitors. They can't represent something in more of a way. They can only, well, like they did, try to get someone like Rod Cullerton to go to the British courts and try and put it in because Mark McMurtry can't. But anyone that's ever looked at anything to do with the OSTF are going to encounter certain particular people that are staunch supporters of the OSTF. And they're not supporters uh, that give information like, you know, their leader. <laughs> they are just like him. They come out, they attack, they abuse, they tell people they are dumb, they don't know anything and they put on this I'm greater than thou attitude. You know, when you learn something, come back. 
And then, you know, you get to the other comments where they say, well, all you've got to do is ask. It's like, oh, how many people have asked so many questions? You know, if you could just answer a simple bloody question for once instead of being a dick, you know. So what are the activities of some of these dicks anyway? The activities of several OSTF members have come under the spotlight in 2020, as have their actions. What part does Mark McMurtry play in directing these activities of OSTF members? In Darwin, the Northern Territory, recently a news reporter was asking, or, uh, sorry, was speaking to Robbie Mills at the front of the Northern Land Council building. Robbie Mills in Darwin. That's the link there, date 26th of October 2020. The reporter asked Robbie, is this a stunt or is there something that you think will actually have an outcome? And Robbie replies, this is not a stunt. This is going to change the way Australia operates. This is going to be worldwide. Yeah, it's going to be viral, mate. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I didn't check to see how many views you got, but don't think it's going viral. <laughs> I don't think it's even going to be going to Australia wide. <laughs> yeah, because you know what? There's a good reason you should ask. Is Mark McMurtry's interpretation of the law correct? But let's get back to what Robbie Mills said uh, about all of... I've left the link here. You can actually listen to what he said further in all the context. So, so after that, what was the outcome? Did it achieve anything real? Can Robbie's actions produce any positive outcome in the future? What would that outcome realistically be? Does Robbie have realistic expectations? Is his interpretation of the law, both tribal and Australian, as flawed as McMurtry's? In another incident, the OSTF handed trespass notices to the Northern Territory Government House, the Central Land Council offices in Alice Springs and Rio Tinto in the Arnhem Land. Again here, we've got another link for Rio Tinto being served on the 4th of November 2020. Did the trespass notices have effect? Did the apparent trespassers leave? Has anything happened at all? Do the trespass notices even have any validity? Can they legally be served and acted on by the laws they are using? Australian. See, they're not using tribal laws. They're using Australian laws to claim tribal validity. Your laws are already valid. You're talking to the wrong people. Now down here is another link for uh, the Northern Land Council in Nullumbai. Sorry, I know it's not quite said that way, but I knew it as Nullumbai when I was in Darwin, living there. By David Cole, 30th of October 2020. And that just gives more of OSTF spiel on their perspective. And yes, more of the toxic, nasty, hate sort of stuff that comes out and negative, yeah. Read it for yourself if, if you haven't already. <laughs> right, so the OSTF claims sovereignty was never ceded. Now, these things that I'm reading out here now come not from my perspective but from the perspective of those in the tribal communities that I have spoken to. You know for what the OSTF claims sovereignty was never ceded. 
uh, it is the opinion of many tribal people that this claim is completely false, wrong. And I'll quote, take a look at history. Australia was conquered, right? Which means sovereignty was ceded. And that is as simple as it gets. No matter how much Mark McMurtry wants to interpret certain laws and twist them for his own in benefit, he cannot change simple basic facts. Australia was conquered. You can't say, no, 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 it wasn't. Well, if it wasn't, you'd actually be in charge, okay? Duh. We are all free citizens, all of us in Australia, whether we're living just by Australian law or by Australian and tribal law or just by tribal law. We all have the same rights and freedoms and we don't need people to give them to us. We already have them. They're called inalienable human rights. Every single person on this planet has them, no matter the circumstances that they find themselves in locally. So, this one here is a link to uh, something that was posted on the 4th of December by the OSTF website on their blog. And I'll quote just a short bit. The main concerns raised over the three days were that the OSTF members were not allowed to give as much input into the decisions as they would like. Women not as much as the men, especially. And many members were concerned that Mark still had full control over everything. Well, he has since he founded it and he's been convener of it and has been managing everything about it and the donations and everything. So it's a good question. Why does Mark McMurtry still have full control? Has a committee or council of members been formed to replace McMurtry's control? Who controls the donated funds? What was resolved at the meeting? Uh, the meeting I'm referring to here is one that he said took place in Alice Springs this year, uh, just prior my well, up here, OSTF meeting in Alice. So what was resolved at that meeting? What actions have been taken from these resolutions? Why do OSTF claim a desire to answer questions yet abuse those who ask? I'm finishing off here. We're getting to the long end. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a few more questions. And you know what? For as many as I've asked, I know you could come up with your own and I've already got questions I didn't even put down here. History is full of the conquered. Few like it, many learn to live with it. And time and the generations changes everything. The only way the conquered may reclaim anything is through the force of war. For never in all your attempts will the conqueror allow success to defeat it in the courts. It will not happen. Now that's just pretty much saying that McMurtry's already said it's a rigged system in their favour and it's like, yes, of course it is. You will not defeat them through their own system. It's as simple as that. And you also will not defeat them through the force of war. What you can do though is understand that the world has changed that it is not the same for anyone in the world as it was 200 years ago. We all move forward in experience. We do not live in the past. We learn from the past. We live in the now to create the future. So what are your actions in the now creating? 
All Australians, no matter their cultural or tribal connections, are born free with all human rights. Do you understand what inalienable rights are? In Australia, people go hungry, people go without shelter, people go without health care, people just go without so many things. It is not selective by race, colour, gender or beliefs. It affects us all. This, the divides we build are the walls we have to over overcome. It is far better to not build divides, but bridges. Has the OSTF built bridges or burnt them? Has the OSTF united the tribes and brought no harm? Have the OSTF changed your life in any positive way? Why is Mark McMurtry still in charge of all the tribes, the OSTF? When will the tribes be equal? Can you even unite under one belief, or is to do so to betray your own tribe? Whose language will you unite under? What song lines will you have to change to conform with the unity OSTF offers? What part of your culture has to die so the OSTF dream of unity may live? Do you realise that L-O-R-E, law, is not the correct term? It is actually L-A-W, law, law. L-O-R-E is merely another example of taking an English folklore, dismissing as fables of the imaginative mind, myths, myths, that can't be proven and are generally not believed. Fiction. And I might just add there that the term is adopted because, oh, you know, you hear people like Mark Darwin go, oh, you know, it's like folklore. It's the law of the folk of the land. Well, folklore has always been bordering on the the version of myth. So it's not about what is real and tangible and workable. It's about what they think people believe might be true that's part of their culture but it not is probably true because we don't believe it. It's just their folklore. So no, this is why and I'm, I'm pointing this out because it is offensive to have two tribes that have complained to me to have their law, L-A-W, belittled and turned into, you know, English folklore. It's not them. It's not real. It's disrespectful. And anyone that uses this folklore to try and sell you they know what they're talking about, they don't. And so to finish it off, what isn't fiction is the real life dramas that happened for Rosalie. Did the OST make it better or worse? Did they do no harm? Now I think many people already know Rosalie's story. And I think she's quite a brave woman, actually. I think she took responsibility for a lot of things that she did not actually... Well, she wasn't actually responsible for. And in certain circumstances, I believe she would have been taken advantage of to put her in that position because they knew that ultimately she's a good woman and she can be talked around like other people can. Now, I have my perspective and the questions that I've asked on the OSTF's position 
is further and very greatly explored in the free man delusion. He's done a wonderful job of dealing with these issues and all the things that have come up around this. You need to look at the flip side of the coin. There is more than just a small perspective to have on this sovereignty issue. And you need to start asking questions before, well, before you have people asking you questions that you can't answer and you end up like Rosalie. Rosalie's in jail. And uh, those of the OSTF that would have facilitated that are running free. One of them is involved with Nightcap on Mingenbull. He's a co-developer with a bankrupt. He's just joined up with the Great Australia Party and another bankrupt. And Max Egan and Ricardo Max Egan is another member of Nightcap on Mingenbull. And I guarantee you if we got some records somewhere down the track, they'd also be showing payouts to people like Max Egan for sales commissions as well, for all the people he brings in. That's a lot of sales commission Tyler Tolman got. 130 odd thousand, that's, yeah, that's a lot of people because, or is it just, I don't know, creative bookkeeping? You never know with these people. They have employed accountants for both the Mount Burrell Commercial and the Nightcap on Mingenbull. But uh, all they can do is produce poorly produced, um, I don't know, they look like they're produced on a Word document rather than by an accounting firm called Med Medoris, who has looked after the books and is the registered office on most of the uh, companies associated with Nightcap on Mingenball members, they all come back to the same accountant, the same address, the same Medoras. So it's the same accountant dealing with the books. So to say that there is no proper record, well, I'd say that Medoras need to lose their bloody accounting license if they can't produce better than what I've seen. Oh, but they didn't produce that, did they? No. Anyway, I've got to the end of that. Ask questions. It's the only way to find answers. And also expect that when you ask questions, you'll probably get another 10 questions with every answer. And that's how you learn and grow. And that's why your story, like any story, should always be constantly evolving. If the narrative is always staying the same, they're spinning their wheels. They're not learning, they're not asking questions, and they're not growing. And really, if the OSTF has not grown or advanced or moved forward in 10 years, what are the chances it will ever do anything other than spin its wheels. And on that note, I'm going to say catch you on the next one. Take it easy.